we were talking backstage a little bit and saying if it bleeds, it leads. Um, uh, James was detained by the Chinese government and that's what brought him to the front page of the New York Times and so on. So I think we need at least a cursory recitation of what happened to you at the uh, 2008 Olympics. A group came to us, me and Evan, um, from an organization called Students for Free Tibet. And they said, look, we've got this idea. We want to somehow get these messages up during the Olympics. Will you make a tool for us to do so? And so I was like, this is sort of serendipitous, right? We were trying to make this device uh, for Yen, but you know, that sort of gig disappeared, but someone else now says they'd like to use this tool. So we said yes, and we say yes to everybody, you know, as a rule. I have no particular, like, uh, uh, <clears throat> iron in the fire for Tibet, um, or maybe I do, but my own personal opinion doesn't really have to do with it. We're just a free speech organization, you know? So you come to us, the free speech issue will help you. You come to us, the product you want to market, you already have your outlet for that, you know? But if you don't have a voice, we're, we'll try our best to give you one. So we made this device. <clears throat> um, they bought us tickets to Beijing. I wasn't kind of completely finished with it um, when I went there, but um, we did some test runs to see if it would work. And the device looks a little bit like this. You know, you've got a laser beam, you have a piece of a rubber mallet that you can buy at the, at the Beijing Walmart Superstore, and you buy a knife at the Beijing Walmart Superstore, and you cut it up, and it becomes an adapter that adapts this laser beam to this uh, optical attachment here that's a 10 times magnifier and expander. <clears throat> and then you can stick some other stuff on the end, and then ultimately, you can see this thing right here, there's a little stencil. So this is like a really dangerous thing to only people who are nuts. Like, to the rest of the world, this is just a silly toy. And you can buy a version of this at the store that, that you know, literally puts smiley faces and hearts and things like that. But to everybody else, this is just a silly toy. So <clears throat> on the way from here, this apartment, to a bar where I was going to tell my friends we did it, tomorrow's the night, and we're going to project on Tiananmen Square and the bird's nest, and you'll have your, your, your message delivered. I was followed by a woman. And I remembered seeing her before. She was cute, you know, and she was always walking in front of me, so I kind of checked her out, and I was like, you know, nice ass. And then I saw her later, and I was like, nice ass, same ass? I don't know, you know, like you, you're paranoid. <laughs> what? <clears throat> and then, uh, then again I saw, and I was like, same nice ass, and I'm fucked, you know, like this, someone's following me, and they must have just seen that I finished this project, and I have to like evade this woman, you know, so I sort of pretended to fall asleep on the subway door and then jumped out really quick. <laughs> and, you know, she comes to the glass, and the train goes on, and I'm like... <laughs> This all happened just like this, you know? And um, so I called my friends. We had some fancy phones you could make phone calls to. We were actually using Twitter to send messages to each other, you know, because when they would confiscate your phones at the end, it would just say, you know, 404 or whatever, you know, like, it would say some number that was not another cell phone address. So I told them, like, I'm screwed, like, I'm busted. I think this woman is following me, but... Um, I'm not sure, maybe I evaded her, and they were like, well, look, just take a circuitous path and come meet me at this bar. So I went and I met him, I told him, I think I'm in trouble, and they were like, well, let's just plan this as if you're not going to be involved, leave here, go to your hotel, get your stuff, catch a train to Shanghai, go back to, you know, Seoul, go on to Tokyo, complete your tour. <clears throat> but um, as we left the bar, there were like 50 police officers and like 10 camera crews, and you know, they were making a big show of arresting us. So, yeah, I got busted, I got arrested, we got interrogated, you know, I lied through my teeth because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And um, <clears throat> then, unlike the 42 other people who had come into China and done Tibet-related projects, something about maybe the level of technology we had or maybe our attitudes or maybe they just didn't like me, um, they decided they'd keep us for a while. So they sent us to this place called Changwen Prison, and we were in Changwen for, we got, we got 10 day sentences in Changwen, along with a lot of other Chinese nationals who were also protesting, and Mongolian men who, you know, his passports had expired, and um, some, like a Nigerian PhD ec economics professor who really wasn't sure why he was there, you know? It's administrative detention, so they don't have to give you a charge or a reason, 
They can just give you a sentence. So we were sentenced without a charge. Our charge informally was upsetting the public order, but I'd actually not done anything except project free beer on a building, which the Chinese love beer. I mean, in Chinese culture, they really have good beer. Um, but it's, it costs. Yeah, no, there's a cost. <laughs> There's always a cost. So yeah, eventually, you know, W said, let our boys go, or I'm going to nuke you, or whatever. I don't know. I don't mean, honestly, I don't know what happened. <clears throat> but for some reason, about, you know, five days into it, we were watching the Olympics. There's a lot of great stories, like, buried in this, but we were watching the Olympics, um, because we did have a TV in our cell, and we watched uh, two hours of TV every day, and it was all ping pong, mandatory <laughs> ping pong. It was like China versus Hong Kong. That's kind of two places then China versus China, then China versus China, <laughs> you know? And so they, they knew they were going to win. So there's occasionally that we'd watch Brazil versus China volleyball, and if they started losing, they'd change the channel. <laughs> <clears throat> so like diving or something. But um, so, so yeah, and then we watched the men's basketball game, and, and in China they love basketball. You know, they're very good at it, and they have like an amazing American, I mean, American basketball star in Yao Ming. And so we were watching this awesome... Uh, game, you know, the USA is like routing this other team. I don't even remember who they were, some other country. <clears throat> and um, uh, everyone's literally in the cell chanting, Kobe, Kobe, Kobe. <laughs> they couldn't speak any English, you know, Kobe, <laughs> Kobe. It was so amazing. And everyone thought they were like, they were like, are you related to that guy named James playing? And I was like, no, it's a different James. This is his last name. <clears throat> nice. <laughs> and he's like an eight foot tall, like muscular black man. So, yeah, so they let us out, kicked us, sent us home. That's kind of the end of the story. I mean, you know, for me it kind of continues because I'm, I'm working on, like, this comic book that documents the whole process. I figure comics are fun to read and, you know, there's parts of it that are serious, but there's a lot of fun parts, too, you know. I met some interesting people. I kind of fell in love with an interrogator, 1300. Oof. Yeah, I miss her. Um. <laughs>